Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to a bonus episode of Ben Franklin's World the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. Today, we have an awesome bonus episode. It's awesome because at the very end of it, I shared details about our very first in-person meetup and because we get to explore a fantastic new exhibit about the American Revolution. The Norman B. Leventhal Map Center at the Boston Public Library has just opened We Are One, Mapping America's Road from Revolution to Independence an exhibit that encourages us to explore the tumultuous events that led 13 colonies to forge a new nation, and an exhibit that will change the way we look at the Revolutionary War, because it will allow us to view the event through the lenses provided by maps and artifacts that were created between 1750 and 1800. Our guide for this exploration is Michelle LeBlanc, Director of Education and Public Programming at the Leventhal Map Center. During our conversation, Michelle reveals how we can use maps to discover information about the past and how they can affect how we view events such as the American Revolution, information about the traveling exhibition We Are One, Mapping America's Road from Revolution to Independence, and how the maps contained within that exhibit portray the 13 American colonies and the British Empire, and Details about the rare objects, maps, and digital tools contained within the exhibition. Now, Michelle also shares the different ways we can view the exhibition, and these ways include its travels to Colonial Williamsburg and the New York Historical Society between 2016 and 2017, and an online portal that will allow you to view the objects in the exhibit from the comfort of your own home. Let's get to it. Please allow me to introduce you to We Are One and our exhibit guide, Michelle LeBlanc. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Michelle LeBlanc is the Director of Education and Public Programming at the Norman B. Leventhal Map Center at the Boston Public Library. Created in 2004, the Leventhal Map Center boasts a collection of over 200,000 maps and 5,000 atlases. Its website also contains a collection of 5,500 digitized maps that anyone with an internet connection can access. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, let's begin by having you tell us a bit about yourself and about your work as the Director of Education and Programming at the Leventhal Map Center. I have been here at the Leventhal Map Center for uh, about a year and a half, actually almost two years now. And my role here is the public programming and public outreach side of what we do with especially with schools and with teachers as well. We offer a number of teacher workshops, for example, on teaching with maps, but also specifically around different content areas and social studies and history and even teaching math with maps, for example, and teaching maps in sciences as well. And we also offer a number of school programs, both in the map center and some outreach to that relate to the curriculum that students are learning in schools around geography, but also history, social studies, and again, those areas of math and science as well. So it's a really busy place. Um, Being in the library, we also do a lot of cross-collaboration with the librarians, both here in the Central Library in Copley Square and also in branches, and bring exhibitions and map-related programming to the general public as well through those routes. It must be very exciting to be able to work in the Boston Public Library, which is one of the oldest libraries in the United States. Could you provide us with a brief history of the library? 
absolutely. Yes, it is actually, it's the first large free municipal library in the country. And it was opened in 1854, although in a different location, fairly close to Boston Common. The present location, the beautiful McKim and Johnson buildings here in Copley Square, um, the McKim building opened in 1895. And what's really lovely about the library is not only its selection of books, but it also has an amazing collection of objects, three-dimensional objects, some of which I can talk about when we go a little further talking about the exhibition that's coming up. It has a lovely rare books department, for example. So it's a lot of people only think of the library as a repository for books, but there's actually quite a bit more here than, than just that and some really unusual and fun items that don't often get to see the light of day unless we have a, a, an exhibit like the one that's coming up on the American Revolution. The library is one of my favorite places to visit in the city. Every time I walk into the McKim building, I have to stand there and appreciate, at least just for a few seconds, the tile mosaics built into the floors. And every once in a while, I enjoy looking up and seeing all the murals and paintings on its walls, such as John Singer Sargent's famous murals, Triumph of Religion. Beautiful. And there are architecture tours and other programming that relate just to the history of the building. But it's a major tourist attraction in Boston. We have a large number of visitors who just come to the library to see it um, and then also come to the Map Center as well, which is located in the McKim building portion of the library. So we have our own gallery here and learning center that is open to the public. The Leventhal Map Center has over 200,000 maps and 5,000 atlases. Could you just tell us about what kinds of maps and atlases make up its collection and perhaps maybe your favorites? Absolutely. Um, So we have a number of collections. The library actually pinpoints certain collections they call collections of distinction, and they relate to different topic areas. But some of our collections are part of those, again, the term collection of distinction. Our greatest strengths um, within that in terms of our map collection pertain to New England and Boston especially. We have a very large collection of maps um, from the earliest maps of Boston up to the present day. The American Revolutionary Era, we have an, a tremendous number of nautical charts, many of which are from the 18th century and earlier, which are incredibly beautiful, and also world urban centers. Those are really sort of the core pieces of our collection, but that's not to say that we don't have a little something in many different areas, but in terms of depth, those are um, general topic areas that our maps go very deep. You mentioned our digitized collection, and actually we're moving so quickly on digitizing that the number is now a 1,000 more than you said at the beginning. We have over almost, I think, close to 6,500 maps that have been digitized on our site and are available for anyone to use, and that grows sometimes by over 100 maps per month. So it's a great way to see the collection if you can make it in, and it has a lovely Zoomify feature, which allows you to get down to the paper fiber in viewing the map. So sometimes there's incredible detail that you can get online that is, you know, even better than the real thing. I hate to say that, but it's a, it can be true in some cases for viewing some of the maps. And we'll include a link to that digital collection on the show notes page for this episode. Now, the Leventhal Map Center has a really new exhibit that has just opened, and it's really exciting, too. It's called We Are One, Mapping America's Road from Revolution to Independence. Michelle, would you tell us about this new exhibition and how it commemorates the 250th anniversary of the Stamp Act? Absolutely. We're very excited about this exhibit, and it's a, it's a really a major endeavor for the library and for the MAP Center, and includes items not only from the Leventhal MAP Center collection, the Boston Public Library collections, but also other major MAP collections from the Connecticut Historical Society to Library of Congress, Colonial Williamsburg, and the British Library. So the original idea for this was to commemorate, as you said, the 250th anniversary of the Stamp Act, uh, which is this year. And this will be the kickoff for a lot of other programming that will be happening in Boston and other cities as well over the next um, many years to commemorate different events as we move forward into the 250th of the beginning of, of the revolution in 1775. So 
this exhibition, the goal is really to tell the story of the revolution through maps and through a geographic perspective. And a lot of our programming, I'd say most all of our programming looks at history through, again, this lens of maps and geography and how geography plays such a huge role in events. So the exhibition is a combination of maps, but also different images, for example, political cartoons, and also three-dimensional objects. And we have several items, um, for example, a powder horn that's in our collection that has a map of Bunker Hill on it. And the exhibit will move from the earliest years of conflict in Boston, looking at what happened here, starting with the Stamp Act, 1765, um, moving kind of backwards, I guess, into the French and Indian War, but also more broadly into Britain's Atlantic Empire and battles that happened in Canada and also through the colonies, and then ending with a look at maps that commemorate the idea of the new nation. So it's very comprehensive, but again, really telling this story um, using these maps and visuals in in an interesting way. Maps offer us a different way to view the event of the American Revolution and the Stamp Act. Could you talk to us specifically how the maps in the exhibition can affect the way we view those events? Absolutely. One thing that is so wonderful about maps um, of this time period is that they are one of the few visual sources we have from the 18th century. There are paintings and political cartoons and landscape portraits, things like that, but often they are very romantic. Um, That said, maps are something that we always encourage anyone looking at them, and I especially in working with students and teachers, is to be a critical reader of them. So we also say, you know, don't trust the map, that there are considerations you should think about when looking at them, especially who the author of the map was. Was it a British author? Was it an American author? And what might that tell you about what you're looking at? But that said, they do give you a tremendous amount of information um, in terms of the geography and the time period. One example of a great map in the exhibition, it's actually the first one that you would see coming in, is a map of 1769 Boston. And this is by John Bonner and William Price. And it's a fabulous map. It shows great detail about Boston streets, um, businesses, wharves, you know, down to very small detail. So a lot of people really love to study this map. It's great, too, I think, on another level because it gives you a real sense of events that were happening in Boston at that time period. So it's 1769. This is four years after the Stamp Act is passed. And by this point, British soldiers have arrived in the town to quell the riots that have happened here. And thinking about Boston's diminutive size, you can certainly feel how such a small scale place, a small town on a peninsula with people close together and suddenly the arrival of this large number of redcoats could really create tension. And so it gives also the sense of something like, you know, a year later after the map was made, you have the Boston Massacre in 1770, and you can see the site on State Street where it happened. And so just thinking about, well, of course there's tension. You have all of these different groups living in very close quarters. So these are the things that the maps um, can help you tease out about a time period, but also how the geography plays such an important role. One of the aspects that caused the American Revolution um, and that the Stamp Act helped reignite is the old debate of where the British North American colonies fit in to the British Empire. And I wonder if you could tell us how the maps and We Are One portray that. You know, where do the colonies fit in these maps within the empire? Yes, I would say the array of maps, they really show Interestingly, the geographic diversity of Britain's empire and the 13 colonies, and I'm always struck looking at them at just this vast expanse of land that they had to cover. You know, looking at the maps as a whole of the exhibition, I think that's one of those rare opportunities to really see everything in one place and to think about not just the 13 colonies, but including Canada um, and the Western territories and what, you know, this this amazing geographical area that they had to had to govern. I think it also gives really interesting cultural insights too. And that's something that 
is harder to tease out by just looking at the map on its own. But again, the exhibition has some great curatorial language behind this. One example I think about is um, we have a, a map from 1765, map maker named Samuel Blodgett. And it shows a battle near Lake George in New York State during the French and Indian War. And it shows um, French and Native American troops battling British troops and their Native American allies. And it's one of the few visual sources that shows a a contrast in fighting styles of the Native Americans. And you can see them fighting from behind trees and rocks versus British troops lined up in this kind of European orderly military fashion. So it gives the two sides of that. I think just a sense of the expanse of land where battles are taking place, where conflict is happening, but also the wide range of, again, this, this cultural sense that we have native Americans, we have the French, we have the British, we have colonists who were born here. So it's a very, um, an interesting mix and looking at everything as a whole. That is a really neat map. And one of the things that surprised me about it was how Blodgett actually tried to make the soldiers appear like real humans. It, it's almost like he wanted to add humanity in this, as well as scale to that battle on Lake George. Yes, it's really wonderful. It does actually have a map of the area and then this tableau, I guess, of the battles. And there is a lot, you're right, there's a lot of humanity to the map because you do see these teeny figures. One of the really fun details in the map, too, is there's a lone figure on Uh, horseback. And there was a kind of a key that came with the map that is not included in the exhibition, but there's information in the label. But he is actually a Mohawk chief. His name was Old Hendrick. And he was killed in that battle. So he stands kind of prominently in this map. Um, And it's just another example of having a little bit of context. Um, We now see, you know, the myriad of stories that come out of that. But many of these maps do have human figures on them, which makes them, they're, they're, I think, especially compelling for anyone, but also especially for children as well. And they give some humanity to these to these battles. One of the other maps of that period that interested me wasn't actually really a map. It was more of like a drawing with a map of the Royal Exchange of of London. Mm. And it was interesting to see where the people in the Royal Exchange, what professions and countries they thought was most valuable to the economic well-being of the empire. So near the center you had, I think there was the the sailors and the French and the Dutch and the Portuguese, but along the outlines of the building, that's where you find New England, Carolinas and Virginia. So it's almost like they're on the fringe of the empire, which was interesting to visualize because that's that's kind of how the colonists felt, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. That is a wonderful example of that and shows all of Britain's empire, but perhaps in their view, um, the colonies being off to the fringes. Now that we've discussed the French and Indian War and what the empire looked during and after that war, how do the maps in the exhibition portray the events of the American Revolution and the war for independence? What sort of changes will we see between the maps as the, as the time period progresses? Yeah, I think that the maps as an example that show revolutionary Boston are some really wonderful examples of British military map making. And some of them are incredible works of, you know, engineering and art on top of everything else. Some of the maps of Boston, a lot of them show locations of fortifications and the locations of continental troops, for example, Washington's headquarters in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the location of some of the troops also in Watertown, Massachusetts. So you have a really skilled set of map makers. Again, a lot of these are British maps or French maps. And we're seeing in this era a really high level of expertise with these maps. Some of the other fun things, though, I think that change our language. And this is, again, an example of looking at the map through the lens of who made it and what's the bias. I'm thinking of one map in particular that uses the term rebel on it. And there are several, actually, that that use terminology like that. But when they're listing where the fortifications are surrounding Boston, they say things like the rebel fortifications. And so this is a clear reminder that 
the revolution has started um, and that now, you know, as opposed to maps from the French and Indian War, we now have two very distinct sides where the colonists are fighting against the British. So that's one specific example that I can um, think of off the top of my head. And many of the others, you know, they're, they aren't necessarily maps that were useful to the British in that moment. It took a while to make the maps and it's not as though they were carrying them around the battlefield. Sometimes the maps were being used to transmit information back to a very hungry audience in England who wanted to know you know, these battles, what, where, what do these places look like and what were the events that were happening there? So in some ways they're kind of news maps and are transmitting this information in a visual format um, back to an audience um, overseas. So that's something that we have to remember as well, that again, the purpose of the map may not have been necessarily to um, move soldiers anywhere, but rather telling the story of what's happening in the colonies. And so you'll see a lot of those in the exhibition as well. Do you happen to know how long after American independence it took for the first maps of an independent United States to appear? So there were several that were done. I, I think the one that's most compelling and it is one of, is the first made by an American, which makes it extra special. And there are very few copies of this map in existence. Um, we have a 1784 map made by Abel Buell. And this was just after the American government ratified the treaty. So just, just after. And what makes this one really wonderful, in addition to just being a, a lovely example of an 18th century map, is that it shows state lines. They, some of them reflect earlier charters, um, however. So there's still, you know, many things are up in the air in terms of where the, where the boundaries are. You'll also see the Mississippi River as the western boundary of several states. So that's quite a ways from, from some of the, the boundaries we know today. Um, the other thing that's so special about this map is that it has a lovely cartouche, which is the decorative element where the title usually goes. And it features wonderful iconography, American iconography, such as the um, new United States flag. And it also has a great image of Lady Liberty holding her Liberty pole. So it's really making a statement about this new country um, and also making a statement about the, the new symbolism. And we'll see this repeated in, in other uh, maps of the United States from there on after. These are images that early Americans would have used to think about their American identity and portray themselves as. So it's interesting that we start to see it so early. Absolutely. Yes. And I think it's a very purposeful way of putting a stamp on this new country. And I think Abel Buell definitely knew what he was doing. Some of these images obviously come right out of out of the revolution. Other maps, you'll, one has uh, George Washington on it. There are others that are dedicated to some of the heroes of the revolution, including Ben Franklin. And that image of the Liberty Pole, the Liberty Tree will show up. There's an earlier French map that has a cartouche showing Showing, um, the Liberty Tree portrayed on a banner. And for those who don't know, the Liberty Tree was a symbol that came out of um, the Stamp Act riots. And it was an actual elm tree in Boston, down in modern Chinatown today in Boston, and was this rallying point for the Bostonians and was in some ways a piece of street theater. There were lots of performances and speeches and Flags and banners were hung, and, and eventually other towns and other colonies as well adopted their own liberty trees. So it was something that, in tandem with the liberty pole, was a very common a common symbol of um, protest and unification as well. We've talked a lot about the maps and images that we can see and We Are One, but the exhibition also contains a lot of actual artifacts from the period. Could you tell us what sorts of special items that We Are One has on display that aren't always available for Americans to see? There are many special items in the exhibition. And in terms of rarity, I think that some of the the maps from the British Library are rarely displayed and are really a special treat um, for visitors to see. For example, there is a set of watercolor views of Boston that show Boston during the Revolution. And they're by a British lieutenant named Richard Williams. And they're, they're just beautiful in and of themselves as pieces of art, but also give this extra 
an extra layer to the maps that you can see what a rural outpost Boston was in so many ways and just rolling countryside and, and this large harbor. Those are really special. I would also say some of my favorites in the exhibition are the powder horns. And we have one in our own collection and one has been uh, borrowed as well. But one is a British powder, British soldier's powder horn and one is an American. The one uh, owned by the Leventhal Map Center is a is uh, British soldiers. And the reason we have it is because it has a, a fantastic map of the Battle of Bunker Hill on it. It also is engraved with um, a saying on one side that says a pox on the rebels and their crimes, which <laughs> makes it a really wonderful example of the sentiment, certainly of the British soldiers who were here in Boston. In, on, in addition, we have items that really tell the story of the revolution from a very sort of personal front. We have uh, a book of poetry by Phyllis Wheatley that is owned by the Rare Books Room in the Boston Public Library. And she was only 17 when she published that book. So it's something that I think is reproduced a lot, but it's rare to see in its, in its real state. So that will be on display as well. Yeah, that's, it's a mix of different items. I think there's also just in a very modern sense, what will be really fun too is uh, we have a couple of touch screens that have some interactive maps where visitors, if they like a particular map, they'll be able to zoom in on it in great detail. There will be additional information that will tell the story embedded in the map um, of different locations and things that they might see on there. And also the ability to even search on a map. If you're, for example, from Connecticut and we have a map of Connecticut, you'll be able to punch in your zip code or town and see if you can overlay the historic map on a modern map of today and take a look at changes um, from modern modern topography of your area to what the map shows from the 18th century. Does that work if we're from California? Does, it does not work if you're from, only if we have the actual map in the exhibition. Although down the line, we'd like to do much, much more of this with our overall collection. But yeah, that's a good question. And this feature will actually be available on our website as well. So if someone isn't able to make it to the exhibition or they want to play around with it a little more, we'll have interactive maps on our website too. One of my favorite objects in the collection was the George Washington Medal of Honor. Would you tell us the fascinating story of that medal? Yes, this is one of my favorites too. And uh, as you asked earlier, rare items. This is one that is very rarely displayed and mostly because of its tremendous value uh, because it is made of solid gold. (laughs) So it's something that the library does not um, display lightly because it needs, um, needs to be well cared for, obviously. This is a medal that was given to George Washington in honor of the evacuation of Boston in 1776. And Washington obviously was the commander of the Continental Forces and responsible for fortifying Dorchester Heights, um, which led to the British leaving uh, Boston in March of 1776. The medal was actually minted in 1789, so towards the end of the war, and given to Washington. And on the 100th anniversary of the revolution, so the centennial in 1876, uh, a group of Bostonians came together and purchased the medal from Washington's heirs and donated it to the library. And it's quite beautiful. It shows Washington in profile on one side. And when you flip it over, you can see on the other side that there's a view of Washington watching the troops on horseback from Dorchester Heights, um, the British troops, I should say, leaving the city. So it's it's a really wonderful and very rare and interesting uh, medal. And we're really delighted to be able to display it as part of the exhibition. Some of us are teachers, and we would love to know more about the teacher workshop I hear you're holding in conjunction with this exhibition. So could you tell us more about the workshop and how we can sign up for it? Absolutely. So we actually have several workshops I should um, tell you about, but our major workshop this summer will be the week of July 13th 
to the 17th, and it's called Map De- Mapping Boston's Role in the Revolution. And this is an institute uh, in collaboration with other historic sites as well, um, the National Park Service here in Boston, uh, the Old North Church, for example, the Massachusetts Historical Society. And we'll be looking at this idea of infusing geography into the study of any historic event, but in this case, the revolution in Boston and what what these maps and other sources that pertain to the geography of the town and the surrounding areas tell us about the events. So how can we look at the Battle of Bunker Hill, for example, um, through the lens of, of the geography and how this played such a huge role? And again, that idea I mentioned earlier about a small town full of British soldiers and the tensions that arise because of that. Our other um, workshop related to the revolution is in collaboration with the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, and that will be the 28th and 29th of July called Visualizing the American Revolution. And we'll look more closely for elementary teachers at how to use visual items like maps and paintings, portraits to help for younger students to really help give them a sense of place and of time and of these events because they're such great resources. And we have information on our website, which is maps.bpl.org. And there is a teacher section, an education section, and a page called professional development. So there are registration forms there that teachers can use to sign up. Those sound awesome. And some of us are not teachers. Can we sign up anyway? Unfortunately, we are looking only for teachers um, who are currently teaching in the classroom and hoping for teachers who also actively teach the American Revolution at this point. But we do offer other uh, lectures and workshops and sometimes other programs that are certainly open to a general public. One of the cool things about We Are One is it's a traveling exhibition and it will actually be on display in a few other cities between November 2015 and 2017. So could you tell us where else we might be able to view We Are One if we can't make it to Boston? Yes. So after it leaves here in November, it will actually be on its way to Colonial Williamsburg and will be there for much of 2016. And following that, it will be at the New York Historical Society in 2017. Now, those sites will be supplementing with some of their own maps and other items, too. So those versions of the exhibition may be slightly different. But any of the items that are part of the Leventhal Map Center's collection will be going on um, on tour. So you'll be able to see those and those other locations. It sounds like if we're revolutionary war junkies, we could go to all three different locations and see a slightly different exhibition, which is pretty exciting, I think. Absolutely. And what will be fun, too, is um, the the exhibition here certainly has a a bit more of a Boston focus. But when you go to Williamsburg or the New York Historical Society, you will have a slight slant towards those colonies. So, yes, if you're a junkie, this is you should follow it around. (laughs) Well, Michelle, this brings us to the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Now, you have already touched upon the fact that maps played an important role in the war for independence and that British officers often used maps to tell the story of previous battles, as well as to kind of help them predict what George Washington and his Continental Army might do next. So, in your opinion, what might have happened if the British Army had not had the access to maps that it had? Do you think the lack of maps would have changed the course of the war for independence? That is a great question. Well, first of all, I think that the British were certainly keenly aware of their need for up-to-date, accurate geographic information. However, I don't imagine, I don't think that the outcome of the war would have been significantly different, at least in terms of the big battles. And when I talk about the big battles that we always mention as being so important to the war, Yorktown, for example, the Battle of Bunker Hill, the British had a lot of information you know, about the conflict in these urban areas, but I think where it, where it might have made a difference and whether this would change the whole outcome of the war, I unfortunately can't say. But 
it was these smaller, these thousands of smaller stories that I touched on a little bit, but the story of economic warfare and the story of transatlantic oceanic supply lines and alliances with Native Americans and battles uh, fought in these rural outposts and forts that are out in these incredibly rural areas, especially during the French and Indian War. And it was incredibly hard for the British to have accurate information for so many of these areas that are also part of the war outside of the bigger parts of the story that we always tell. So I have to wonder, you know, if they had nothing, <laughs> for no maps for any of these other aspects of the war would, you know, this lack of knowledge and terrain, I think it really would have made it tricky for them to gain control of the whole picture. So, you know, I think that, Yes, in some ways. I don't know. I, I think that the, the outcome probably still would have been the same, but I think there are a thousand stories already that show us that without the knowledge that the British needed in some of these smaller stories within the war, that it really did make a difference. So, But I'm going to go with no. I don't, think, I don't think that it would have made such a big difference because they were they were probably pretty well aware of what was going on in, in the major locations. Before we conclude, would you tell us what other exhibits or special events that the Leventhal Map Center or the Boston Public Library have in the works? Yes. Yeah, so we have a smaller gallery. So the We Are One exhibition will be in what's called our McKim Exhibition Gallery at the library. And it's a larger space than what we have in the Map Center. But we have a lovely gallery. And we have a current exhibition called Literary Landscapes Maps from Fiction, which, as it sounds, is uh, a collection of maps from different works of literature, everything from fantasy to Winnie the Pooh down to the Chronicles of Narnia. So this will be up actually through the fall. It's a fantastic uh, exhibition. I encourage everyone to come take a look. And in tandem with the We Are One exhibition, we'll also have an interactive Liberty Tree, which will be outside the doors of the Map Center and encourages visitors to engage in a conversation about what liberty means to them today. And they actually can create a leaf and hang it on the tree or post it on social media using a couple of different hashtags. So this is a way to tie in some of those themes of the exhibition, the historic themes to a more modern um, thinking about what, what do we take from the story of the revolution and how do we continue to talk about it today? And then as we said earlier, the library is just a fabulous place to come visit. And there are a number of programs that will be happening in collaboration with the We Are One exhibition throughout the year. Many of them are lectures. We have a family day coming up on June 6th, which will have some uh, living historians who will be in costume telling some of the stories that they'll see in the exhibition. So all of this information is available um, on our website and you can get the full programming list there. Where is the best place to look for more information about you, the Leventhal Map Center, the Boston Public Library, and the We Are One teacher workshops? So our site for the Leventhal Map Center is maps.bpl.org. And there is also bpl.org, which has a full calendar of all events that will be happening uh, within the library. But the Leventhal Map Center site does have a designated section just pertaining to the American Revolution and the workshops, the interactive maps, the programs, um, and even our portal of American Revolution maps, which has a lot of new digitized maps from the exhibition and also beyond that from different collections will be available there as well. So that's a great place to start to get all of this information. And I'll save you the trouble of having to remember those URLs because I'll include links in the show notes page for this episode. Michelle, thank you so much for sharing We Are One and the resources that the Leventhal Map Center has with us. You're welcome. I'm so glad to have been here. Historic maps present us with another way to view the past. As Michelle revealed, mapmakers created maps to tell a story and to show the world as the people of their time viewed it. Maps of the American Revolution help us gain a new perspective of the event because they show us how the colonists viewed themselves and their place within the British Empire, how the British Empire viewed its colonies and their place within the empire, and how the differences in these views produced the scenes recorded in the battle maps of the War for Independence. 
You can find information about We Are One, the Leventhal Map Center, its teacher workshops, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode, benfranklinsworld.com slash maps. In episode 25, I revealed that the Ben Franklin's World community will celebrate its own commemoration of the 250th anniversary of the Stamp Act on August 15, 2015, with a special tour of revolutionary Boston. Since then, I have worked with Boston by Foot, and we have ironed out a few more details about this special event. Our meetup and tour will take place on Saturday, August 15, at 10.30 a.m., The tour will last about two hours, and tickets will be $17 each. All proceeds of the tour will benefit Boston by Foot, a volunteer organization that provides quality tours of Boston for anyone who would like to know more about our amazing city. Tickets aren't on sale just yet, but they will be soon. For the most up-to-date information, please visit benfranklinsworld.com and sign up for the Franklin Gazette mailing list, which will include an invitation to join Poor Richard's Club, the official social community of Ben Franklin's World listeners on Facebook. Finally, I would appreciate it if you would tell all of the teachers you know about the amazing workshops the Leventhal Map Center is hosting this summer. Even if they don't teach history, they will likely have colleagues that do. By helping our educators gain access to these amazing programs, we will help inspire a new generation of history lovers. Please let me know if you plan on viewing this exhibit in Boston, coming on our 250th anniversary Stamp Act tour, or if you have any questions or feedback about the show. Send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, or tweet me at Liz Covart. And remember... Never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.